hello everybody. So we are from Carnot Computing, and we are here to talk you about uh, smart splitting with uh, Carnot Blender platform. So let's talk uh, about Carnot Blender platform. So does anybody in, in this room know the Blender platform? Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, we at Carnot are doing heaters. So it looks like a normal heater, but the difference is inside. So inside you have motherboard and CPUs. And so this is producing a lot of heat, as you know. So we put this in uh, this new heater, and we put this in people houses so they get heat. And uh, when people use our platform to do rendering, it will eat people. So we have a dual-sided business model. So on one side, we are a cloud platform. We sell computation time to, to individual, to, to companies. And on the other side, we are producing the heater, and uh, we put it in people's houses, and we pay the electricity bill for them. So they are heated for free with other people rendering. So, uh, but we are not doing only ITER. So yesterday and today we are doing the CURAD, so the first digital ITER. And we are also doing other kind of computation because the main goal of our platform is to be agnostic. And we are able to deploy computation on what we call CURAC. It's like a, a little shelf with a lot of motherboard. It's the cheapest way to have a lot of computation in a small room. So you can put this in a building and have a, a lot of heat to, for your building. And we are also able to use public cloud like Amazon to send computation. It's the same for our clients. So they send us the, their computation. And we can send it to the heaters. Or if there is not enough heaters, we can send it to pub public cloud. And we are also working on eating uh, water and using private cloud and company to be able to, to scale uh, if the people need a scale. So with this, we are not only doing uh, Blender uh, rendering. We are a generic compute, compute platform. So we, are, we can do computation greener because uh, the heat is not wasted. It's faster because uh, you can get 100 of CPUs in less than 40 seconds. And it's cheaper because we, has, we have no infrastructure cost. We do not need to build data center. We do not need to cool data center. And uh, so we also have a Python SDK to start computation on our platform. So with this line of Python, you can start a Blender rendering on our platform and get the result back. Uh, within minutes. So we also worked uh, with the Blender Foundation. We did all the rendering for the Cosmos Landromat movie. And now we are going to talk about the smart splitting problem. OK, thank you. So uh, as he explained, we are trying to make a, I mean, a, a distributed rendering. And for this, we use a classical representation of how you can formulate this uh, process in a distributed manner. So this model, it's not, I mean, it's not us that propose it. It's a general model that exists in the literature in, for parallelizing a uh, rendering process. You have, in general, three stages. The first stage where you compute uh, what you call geometry processing. Uh, we, we are using uh, the Blender motorcycle, so we are working mostly with uh, ray tracing, but at this stage you can also do uh, ray casting or, I mean, rasterization if you are using uh, another engine. And the last stage is compositing. So this is the general way that, we, I mean, this is the three main phases that people distinguish when they want to think about how to parallelize. And in the scientific literature, uh, given this process, people say that there are different ways to order the di these different tasks. And depending on the way you order them, you can make a sort first, a sort middle, or a sort last parallelization. And we, we are doing what we call a sort first parallelization. In sort first parallelization, the main idea is that uh, the geometry processing task is uh, mean uh, the same task for all the different subtasks that you have in, your, in the workflow. So when you will have to start the ray tracing stage, uh, the all, each different process, we just have to work on the sub part of the image to which, I mean, that was assigned to him. So 
at the end, the compositing task is easy because you have just a different sub-image that you have to just join. And we, we chose this I mean, solution because uh, we have a geo-distributed cloud, as he explained it, and for communication, in a communication viewpoint, if you want to distribute computation. I mean, if you make a lot of, uh, we want to make a lot of communication between not, the rendering process would not be that good. So for us, it was more interesting to have a compositing phase that would be really easy. So as I said, the good point, I mean, the bad point is that you have a duplicated task in the, at the beginning because you have several nodes that are doing the same thing. But the good point, as I said also, is that you can avoid expensive communication cost. And uh, we, we cannot just uh, afford this kind of communication cost if you imagine a geo distributed context. Now, for creating parallelism in this model, as I say, uh, we decompose an image in a uh, a sub-region, in different sub region And in our cases, we use a rectangle tiling solution. That is, we decompose the image in different rectangle. Actually, it's not really rectangle because you have to consider the, the dimension of the, uh, the RGB dimension. So in general, we work with 3D image, so probably it's not really a rectangle tiling, but you can see in a geometric way as a rectangle. And uh, we have several generic decomposition that we propose. If you get connected to our platform, you can give in your image if, if you want to render it or if you want to make a parallel rendering for video, you have diff different generic decomposition that uh, you can choose to use. So our question now is that uh, this is, for instance, what you can have when you have an image that you load here and you want to make rendering. You have these different uh, set of decomp I mean, you have this set of decomposition that you can choose, and we also have um, another mode that we introduce it. That is the automatic mode. The idea is to propose to user, I mean, to our customer, an automatic decomposition that might be efficient depending on their computation. And the goal of this presentation, I mean, the goal of this task was to see how to, we can improve the actual uh, functioning of this mode. So um, to I mean, to, to let you see how the problem is in a, in, a, I mean, in a practical way, if you have an image like this, you can make a square decomposition. And this can lead to this different time if you make the rendering of this different, I mean, uh, sub-image on different process, I mean, processes. And if you choose the decomposition, you have another time. And if you choose this one, you have another time. So if you consider that you want to optimize the maximal time that we stand for the processing, depending on the decomposition that you choose, you won't have the same runtime. So the goal was to find a way to, to, to build, I mean, to propose an automatic intelligent decomposition that, given an image, we can automatically apply and make sure that this optimizes, I mean, the profit for the client. And given this question, there are two sub-questions that we considered. The first is, what is the processing time of the different regions? Because uh, if you decompose like this, these, I mean, these are run time that we measure after, after running, after processing. But we have to have an estimation before, otherwise we can choose between these different decomposition. And once we have an estimation of the different, I mean, run time we can spend in different regions, the second question will be how we will effectively tile the image in practice. So these are the two sub questions that we consider uh, for this problem. And uh, for the first question, we started to, I mean, we did several assumptions on what can impact the final runtime you have in the processing. So we imagine that the number of samples probably might impact, I mean, the quality, I mean, the runtime that we spend, the ratio also that we are using, the number of cells, uh, and by cell, I mean, arc tree, polygons, or whatever, I mean, whatever you use for representing, for composing the image. The number of frames also might be, I mean, something that we saw in literature that might be important. And the, there is also this concept I, that I, not, I do not really clearly understand what it is, but there is the notion of pixel intensity in uh, several, I mean, uh, scientific paper that might be a parameter that impact the runtime that we spend in this processing. And uh, given this assumption, we, try, we started to see uh, how we can imagine the problem, I mean, how we can uh, tackle the problem. And one solution that naturally came in mind was to say that we can make, given an image, we can make a, a rendering, a first rendering with a few number of samples. So it's uh, 
bad rendering. It's not the rendering that I means the target rendering. But we think that if you make a rendering with a few enough of sample, you might have an estimation that you could use now to uh, create a parallelism with the uh, definite, I mean, the good number of, uh, of sample at the end. So this is the general idea that we propose it, and you can do the same with the number of ratio or whatever. I mean, what other parameter we can consider in the assumption, in the list of assumptions that we consider. So, and we proposed this idea, and we started to see. We tried to see whether or not, I mean, it's even meaningful. That is. Can we really say that the number of samples have an impact on the runtime of the processing? And when we, we consider a, set of, a subset of image, we took around, uh, I mean, uh, 96 image, and we saw that if you change the number of samples, you can find like a linear regression model that say linearly how the runtime is correlated with the number of samples that you, that you use. But our database you can criticize, and this would be a right critic here, is that the database might not be representative of the, uh, I mean, the entire type of image that we could have. And we also found another linear regression when you consider also the number of ratios. So uh, this was quite good. That means that we can effectively think that if you make a rendering with few number of samples, you can have an estimation that you could project for uh, finding the best way to decompose the image in a parallel computation. So the second result we found is that we don't need too many samples too many sample to have a, a final projection that is meaningful in terms of uh, uh, computing time. This doesn't mean, I mean, you, here for instance, this runtime time that I've put is what we could expect giving a first fine-grain subdivision, subdivision that we made of the image and where we collected the runtime based on a few number of samples. But uh, this doesn't mean that this will be the final, I mean, the real runtime that we have in practice. This, I mean, this data only means that we could have enough information to be representative depending on the best way to uh, create, I mean, parallelism. So this result was important because, because of this, we could continue and address the second question. So the second question for us was now that we have something like this. So we take the image, we make a fine grain, I mean, uh, we make a fine grain rendering uh, where we use few number of sample or a few uh, small ratio, and we have value like this. So we have like a grid where you have different number that correspond to the runtime you can expect for this different zone. And now we want to create, blo I mean, block from this fine grain zone. So here, for instance, if you want to subdivide in two, the question for you can be to split like this or like this. And, but now you have, you have data that's set for you that if you split in a way, you have an estimation of the real run time that you could expect. So to address this, so I say that assuming a grid with uh, a decomposition, I mean a fine grain decomposition, wow. Given now that we supposing now that we have a fixed number of processors, the question for us is to see how to share the different frames between the uh, the processor we have. And a natural solution for this is that if you have a fine grained decomposition of the image, uh, there is something in computations that call that's a problem in computation that is called the M partition problem. That naturally is a solution for the problem, because if you have different image and you have different sub block, you can just uh, considered formulate, I mean, the problem of this load balancing problem uh, or the problem of the imbalance you have as an M partition problem, it's a natural solution we could use. And even if the problem is NP head in the literature, we have several, I mean, it's a well studied problem, you have several good heuristics that you can use for tackling the problem. But uh, we formulated this. But we found something in practice that doesn't really work. Because as he says in the beginning, uh, we are a cloud. And because of, the cloud, uh, because of the cloud philosophy, we have different level of scheduling. So QBlender doesn't really, can't really tell to the, I mean, a processor to directly do something. QBlender must just create a task and send this task to another scheduler that will now really decide on where the task will be deployed. So we have a, what I call a resource oblivious SAS. I mean, software, software as a service logic, and you have this in almost all cloud computing architecture. And this 
complexify, I mean, the scheduling when you are coming from the classical, I mean, parallel computing field because you don't have, you, you don't really control the processor. You can, you just control an abstraction that might correspond to uh, a processor, but not to the processor you are expecting that it's corresponding to. So, uh, because of this, we were obliged to formulate the problem in a different manner. So, we thought that a simple thing to do is that whether or not, how, whether or not the scheduler is, whatever the scheduler is designed for, we think that if we send a set of tasks, one thing to reduce the imbalance is just to make sure that if the processor, the scheduler, put these tasks together, they will end almost at the same time. So the question might be to just to say that if you have M processor, and this is what we formulated, so we say if you have M processor, just try to create M blocks to make sure that the difference between the maximal load and the minimal load will be reduced. And it's, I mean, it's quite funny here because when I, I mean, what we, we formulated all this work, we found that we are coming back to a null well studied problem in computer science. That is the rectangle tiling problem where you have several solutions. You can make a rectilinear partition. Depending on the way you want to think the partitioning problem, you have several ex existing solutions. So we found a lot of solutions in the literature. But for us, all these solutions were too regular. That is, the way they decompose the image were too regular. For instance, here you precise two dimensions. You always, I mean, for the best solution we found, we always precise two dimensions, or you make a 1D partitioning, and you then take each partition and make again 1D partitioning. So we want, wanted to think about something that might be more interesting. And the solution we propose, it's a simple greedy algorithm whose idea is, I mean, it's like, uh, it's a principle of brick laying. You imagine your image as, uh, I mean, it's like a surface that you want to build, and your goal is to take rectangle that each converge to the mean, I mean, average load that you compute, and uh, you just fill the re you just fill the rectangle like this. So you put brick by brick. It's a grid algorithm, but it, uh, this is all, I mean, uh, what you can have, and we try it. There are some rules that are put here, but it's a quite simple greedy algorithm. Now, what's good is that with this greedy algorithm, we have some results. So we have some, some tiling like this, for instance, that when we, we, we ask that, given this image, how we can split it in five, in five in our architecture, and this is what the greedy algorithm proposes. It's not a regular decomposition, it's a, a, what we, it's a kind of de decomposition that we are f thinking that we are expecting to have, finally, in practice, so we were. This was some, somehow a good result, but uh, we can. We also did an analysis of the algorithm, and the first thing that came in mind when I started to analyze is that I discovered that we are still doing 1D partitioning and 1D partitioning. That is, the first brick that I choose here will decide on the complete structure that we have finally at the end. It's really the brick laying functioning, but uh, you have this kind of constraint. That is, the choice of the first brick is really a strong and hard problem, so we are not quite, we are not too different from what exists in the literature, but we can propose more diversified uh, kind of uh, partitioning. So the algorithm is clearly not optimal, but and somehow we have like a vertical effect when you have a huge image, because the more you are going, the more you have different, I mean, the more you have layer in breaks, the more the layer are becoming more and more vertical. So these are some phenomenon that we identified and found that we should improve in the algorithm. So uh, there are some open challenge for us is, for instance, one is to make a, a comparative analysis between uh, uh, the alg algorithm that we propose and the related approaches. The related approaches are the one I cited before because it's a well-studied problem, as I say, finally, in computer science. But uh, what is already sure is that this algorithm has really interesting results comparing to what we have like, uh, what we have now for automatic, I mean, image uh, decomposition. Uh, we are thinking about a uh, different way for integrating the algorithm and we want, at least, I mean, of course, to improve the algorithm so I will let Clement to 
So just uh, as a conclusion, we, we, we would like to thank the people who trust us and we would like to repeat that we still strongly believe in open source and the community and the fact that people are using our platform help us to encourage and to improve the open source com community. And so thank you everybody. And uh, if you want to try our Blender website, you can go to Blender dot carno dot com and if you are more interested in general computation you can use uh, computing dot carno dot com if you register you will have free renders hours that you can use to try your platform and if you have any question you can reach us in the hall after the presentation or you can contact us by email if you prefer thank you <laughs>